So tonight, I turn this over to Kristen Parks, who is going to be representing the Genealogical Forum of Oregon and give you a good idea of where to get started on searching genealogy on the Mac. Kristen. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have dabbled in genealogy research. I see a couple of people, so a few of you. The principles of genealogy research are not unlike any other kind of research, especially historical research. The idea is to find quality sources that address the question that you want answered. And so when you start a genealogy project, your overarching goal is to find as much information as you can about as many people as you can. But when you actually start the projects, you want to begin with a very measurable goal. So when I started, I started with both my husbands and myself, and in, rather than saying, when did the Parks family come to the United States, no one knew. Well, okay, honey, what's the farthest back ancestor you can remember? My grandpa. Okay, let's start with great grandpa then, <laughs> and we can work our way back. So you start with a goal, and you think about any type of paperwork that could have been generated by your ancestors. So now, nowadays, there's paperwork, and a lot of it is electronic paperwork. Uh, pretty much, we can't do anything. We can't, we can't even get a cup of coffee without generating paperwork. But back in the day, that wasn't really so much true. Um, the types of paperwork that were generated tended to be uh, some of the big events and frequently dealing with money and uh, marriage records, money, uh, birth records, eventually money, death records, death certificates didn't, really didn't start appearing, especially here until well into the 1900s. But you better know that if there was property and money in the estate of the person who died, there's a probate, probate record somewhere. Now it may have been destroyed, but there was one generated, and that's actually what began the court system in the state of Oregon was somebody rich died, and they needed to adjudicate and settle that, that, that estate. And so some of the reasons that people will do their family, maybe they have missing information in their family. There's an adoption in the family. There's a separation, whether it's a divorce or an early death or a family feud or something that nobody will talk about. That when the kids say, Mom, what about this? Oh, hush, go play. <laughs> Here's a piece of chocolate, don't bother me. Um, another reason that kind of catches people's attention when they're researching is there is a family legend, there's a mystery, that thing that everybody talks about but no one can quite prove, the Cherokee princess or my mother-in-law is convinced that because her mother's maiden name, no, her father's mother's maiden name was James, that they're related to Jesse James, that's their family legend. So um, sometimes you wanna prove that something is either right or wrong and you would be amazed at how people really latch on to these unsupported factoids and there's just no reaching them. Um, if you disprove it. Uh, some people really want to make connections. Our modern society is getting more fragmented. People move with jobs and for the, you know, for whatever reason. And they want to meet their cousins. They want to find out who they are. And they remember vaguely when, you know, when I was, when we were five years old, we'd meet with these cousins for Thanksgiving and now I don't even know their names. Um, so it is a way to kind of deepen your connection with your extended family, or maybe you just take pride in being Irish, or pride in being German, or pride in you know, be your you know, ethnic or cultural history, and it's a way to research and to find out where in Ireland are you from? Where, where are you from? And um, 
then sometimes it's just plain curiosity. It happened with me. My fifth grader had a social studies project. Mom, we need a family tree. Ancestry's free for 15 days. So we got on Ancestry and created our three-generation family tree, printed it off. She got an A in her class, and I just could not leave those shaky leaves alone. <laughs> For those of you who have done re genealogy research, you probably know what I'm talking about, and anyone who has a touch of OCD probably knows what I'm talking about as well. Um, so... Where do I start researching? I had already addressed the idea of having a concrete question. Um, but first of all, you write down what you already know. Uh, you know stuff about yourself and your siblings. You don't want to research yourself, but it's good to get it down because you know your grandchildren aren't really going to know this stuff. You talk um, the information about your parents. It's Kind of amazing how much your own kids don't necessarily know about your parents so write that stuff down um, your aunts your uncles um, your grandparents you want to come up with as much as you can the vital statistics birth marriage death um, where you've lived because if you have a common name i have a william davis that i look for yeah there's a lot of william davises it's not pretty and so if you have anything approaching a common name um, you want to keep track of where you, where these people were in a particular time sometimes jobs and professions can come into it if you John Smith the bricklayer is a different person than John Smith the doctor or what have you and sometimes that's the only way you can tell two people who are apart which John Smith is mine well it's the, he's the bricklayer. He was a bricklayer two censuses before, and the one census before, and the one census after. This guy's mine. Um, also, some professions and will have their own journals. Like, uh, even on Ancestry has a da database for um, retired medical professionals, retired doctors. Uh, there are alumni magazines, and this brings us into schools, too. There are alumni magazines. There are some towns are very um, proud of their college students that reside in that town or maybe the town that you came from and they'll run articles about oh well you know john smith went to portland state and they'll talk about those kinds of things in ways that you can document later military service is huge the things that i have found in civil war pensions or um I found, when I was at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., I found a medical file for a Civil War veteran who was admitted as a patient to the Veterans Hospital in Los Angeles and in that facility, and he had a file this thick. And it was all, now I knew more about the man's blood pressure than I ever really needed to know, but it also talked about where he had lived in the last 20 or 30 years and it gave specific information about his first wife and I wasn't even sure, I wasn't even certain he had been married a first time. And so records like that, military service records, can really fill in, fill in gaps if, even if you're not a member of the military, if you had a family member who was a member of the military, it can really fill in some gaps. Um, okay, I have a lot of stuff, can't just write it on a cocktail napkin. You can build a family tree online. Uh, there are several reputable companies. Uh, family Search is run by the LDS Church, and they are huge. They have so many people who contribute. Ancestry is another huge one. You can build your own tree. Uh, My Heritage is kind of a new one, but they are really coming up fast. Uh, there's also Find My Past, and then there's another one called WikiTree. And I'll, I'll talk about all of those in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, offline software. By the way, my son did tell me offline software is by definition offline. And so he thought I should change that. And I didn't. Um, <laughs> what's that? 23 That's a DNA uh, company. They do DNA results. And so they're not really a tree builder kind of place. Um, 
if you don't want your personal family information online, um, or you have family members who don't want it there, or maybe you're sick of people changing in your information online, um, or you want to generate re reports or projects or, or scrapbooks, or you want to do a website, a lot of these software products will help you do that in a way that the online databases won't. And so Family Tree Maker, you know, when you Google the top 10 genealogy software programs or the best programs for Mac, these are some of the biggest ones. And I will talk about these also in a moment. So here are our online databases. Um, the first one I started with is FamilySearch, and it is totally free. Yay! It is the best value in genealogy websites out there. They have a huge, can you read that at all, Alyssa? It's a little small. Um, they have a huge collection of records. They've been microfilming records all around the world for decades. Uh, their searchable databases are not as, they don't have as many searchable records as Ancestry, but they have just a huge collection of essentially online microfilm that you can go in. And if you want to look at the deed book for Johnson County, Illinois from 1872 to 1876, they probably have that. And you can go in and you can turn the page by page by page until you find what you're looking for. Or you can go in and look at the handwritten index of D books from 1871 to 1885 in Johnson County, Illinois. Um, and you can try to decipher their handwriting. That It's there. It's not always easy to find, but there's a lot there. Um, they have a very thorough research wiki, and I consult that so often because I don't know off the top of my head when Kansas started keeping death records statewide. I, that's always something that you want to look up because you don't want to spend half an hour looking for a death certificate for someone who passed away in 1895 and they didn't start keeping statewide death certificates until 1906. That you just, sometimes you just, you spend a little bit of time up front to save a lot of time at the back end. Uh, they do have a mobile device app that you can use that's free. Um, one drawback is there's only one tree allowed per account, so if I want to do my family tree, I do it in my account. If I wanted to create a separate account to do my husband's family tree, I would need to create one for my husband and then log in as him. So, you know, it, it, and the accounts are totally free, and I've never been spammed. Uh, there is no branded DNA test. That family search doesn't do DNA tests. And part of the beauty of the DNA test is if you are fishing for cousins, and it's one thing that Ancestry does that I'll talk about in a second, is you can attach your tree to your DNA test. And if someone out there matches your DNA, then you can see where on the tree you guys match. And uh, they have a memories section where you can just upload photos, video, audio, that kind of thing, and uh, anyone can see it. Uh, family history centers are free to everyone. Uh, you can go, you can, the way the family search website works is they have four levels to it. If just you're Joe Blow off the street, you're in your pajamas and bunny slippers at two in the morning doing research, you, there, that's like the lowest level of access. And from time to time, you'll come across a record that you really want to look at, and there's a little key on it, and it means it's locked, and you can't see it. And that doesn't always make me happy. But if you go to a, uh, there are libra affiliate libraries who some of those little locked records disappear, and you can see them. And the Genealogical Forum of Oregon is in the process of applying to become a tier two affiliate library so that a number of those keys will disappear in their facility. 
Then tier three is the family history centers, and there are tier four is the main facility in Salt Lake City, the primary family history library. The way the um, usage agreements, the licensing agreements that they have with a few record owners is that only one person can view it at a time. And so even at the family history center, at the main library in Salt Lake City, every once in a while, if you have that kind of record that you're looking at, there might be a key over it because the person two floors up is looking at it already, and then you just come back later. So that's how that works. Ancestry, it has a very, God, that is so small, I'm so sorry. Um, it has a very easy to use interface. You can, um, you build your tree, it's pretty intuitive. They have, um, just a huge collection of records to search, and they're searchable records. They have more than anybody else. There's, uh, they have mobile apps that are free. Um, they sell DNA kits, like I explained a minute ago. They have a separate messaging platform. There are message boards, inquiry boards, that type of thing, so you can kind of <coughs> collaborate with other people without having to give them your real email address, which is nice. Um, Membership fees can get a little expensive, particularly if you are interested in the world membership. Uh, you can go, the GFO has the Ancestry Library Edition, and most public libraries have the Library Edition. You, have, you can research all of the records, but you cannot build a tree at the library. You can only do that with your account. And so that is the one drawback. But if you don't want to have an online tree anyway, you can take your software program, go to the library, do some research, enter your records on your program, and you're good to go. So it is, that's a nice thing, and I already talked about the, the message boards and help desk. My Heritage, the new kid on the block, their business model is really designed around their DNA tests, and so they have a, a lot of records that are searchable and available. Um, but their prim the primary part of their business model, even more so than Ancestry, is to um, get people to take those DNA tests and create as large of a pond to cousin fish as possible. So they are not there yet, but they're, they're working on it. And in the meantime, they may have different records than Ancestry or Family Search. They may have a licensing agreement that is exclusive and it never hurts to check, especially if you can get on it for free. Um, the thing about their DNA testing is apparently, uh, and I was reading about this on a, on a blog from one of the big wigs in the DNA community, that MyHeritage may hold on to more rights to your DNA results than some of the other ones. So make sure you read those um, agreements carefully. Uh, they have a free smartphone app, um, subscription is required. Find My Past started out as a purveyor of British and Irish records, and they're past. Um, they're adding U.S. records because they really want to break into the U.S. market, and so many of us do have English heritage somewhere, and so we'll end up there sooner or later. Uh, it's a subscription site. That it does cost some money, uh, but they have a super easy interface to build your tree. Um, and the thing that I love about Find My Past is they have the exclusive rights to the periodical source index. And so Percy for short. Uh, back in the day, before the internet, genealogy journals were the internet. You would get this lovely journal one, once a month, once a quarter, maybe once a year even, and it would have school records from Consolidated District 4J in, from 1903 to 1906, <laughs> A through F, and then next month was you know, the next part of the alphabet, or they would have tax lists, or they would have really local indexing projects that were huge. Uh, I was looking at a journal from like 1936 uh, a couple of months ago, and it was describing a family, a privately owned family cemetery in the sticks back in the Midwest, and it talked about how it had been, that that, had, that cemetery had probably come into being because it was rumored to have been the early meeting house for the local Methodists before they had built their church. And I'm like, oh, well, that explains a lot, actually. 
But because the article was so old, they had people who knew the people who started the cemetery back in 1936. So yeah, it was secondhand information, but it was a lot more reliable than any anybody could come up with now, three, five generations later. So those types of articles are really, they can be such a good resource for you. And um, so in front of the paywall for free, you can search for periodical articles uh, if you want to get, um, and it'll tell you what year that the article was published, which is fine because most of them are only published four times a year and you can go look it up. If you want to know the exact um, issue, you know, volume, month, year, everything, a little bit more comprehensive information, that part of it is behind the paywall. But if you want to look up periodical articles, that's the place to do it and that part of it is free. And they have newspapers and stuff too. Um, WikiTree really is not a research database. It is just an online tree, and you enter your tree information. Uh, you can post photos. It's, it was kind of designed to be a way for family members to connect or communicate. There can be a family count. There's a family calendar on there. There is, uh, you know, so your member great aunt, great aunt Irma's birthday, if you want to. You can, if there's help to plan family reunions, that sort of thing. Uh, it's free. It's, again, it's not research, but it is a place to stick your tree online. So, offline software, <laughs> there are several ones. Um, family Tree Maker is kind of the biggie. It's the one, it used to be owned by Ancestry, and then they sold it. Um, Mac Kiev is the new owner, and since they're Mac, it's very, it's designed for the Mac, um, not maybe to the extent of Mac Family Tree, but it's huge, and the thing that is nice about, about it is that you can integrate with Family Search and Ancestry, so if you're, you have your Mac Family Tree Maker up and you're inputting and it'll show kind of a hint, oh, there's a record that you might be interested in and you click, click, and suddenly you're on Ancestry. If you have an Ancestry subscription, you're right there. And then you can connect that Ancestry record to your Family Tree Maker tree or that Family Search record to your Family Tree Maker tree without the heavy duty input, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, they, you can sync the tree, you can invite other people to contribute to your tree if you want to, so that if another family member goes on a research trip, they can add stuff to it and it just syncs. They have a ton of reporting features. You can print off so many different kinds of reports. There are interactive maps, including a migration map to show where your people went. Um, and from where you can do timelines, there are charts and graphs, and you can do them in different colors, different fonts, you can show different things. It's, uh, there's even a scrapbooking feature. So there's a lot of the reporting features that you don't get from you know, Ancestry or Family Search. Um, at the GFO, we actually have two Family Tree Maker <coughs> special interest groups. Uh, once a quarter, there is a beginning group for you know, if you're just getting started. And then there's another one that meets most months and it's more of a lab and you can be pretty much any, pretty much any um, experience level. And some, I, from what I'm told, uh, they have, uh, sometimes they, it's more of a group thing and sometimes it's more individual and they'll walk around. Have you been there? I'm the lab assistant. I can facilitate uh -huh. that. Oh, okay, so yeah. So people have Thank questions you. about that, that strategy. Yes, so talk to her about that. So that's a great program. Mac Family Tree, it was built for Mac. It interfaces with Mac better. Um, it, there are, uh, uh, you can get apps for your other mobile devices. Um, the charting, apparently, by the reviewers. Several reviewers consider the charting abilities to be superior to Family Tree Maker. Um, and there are templates for publication, whether it's a book or a website, which is really nice. Um, it's integrated with Family Search, but not Ancestry. 
there's one called Heritus, and it was developed in Europe. And their main feature is that they have like their own family tree database that provides hints. So you don't necessarily research the records, but you have access to what up to other people's trees, what they think they, you know, what they think that information is. Um, and it is, it's much more, since it started out in Europe, it's more European. So if you're looking for Philippine records, maybe that's not your first choice. Um, but it definitely is good for what it does. Uh, it generates reports, migration map, it has a, a slide show feature, uh, there's a mobile app, um, let's see, oh, and the other thing, you can talk to Siri and make Siri do things, like tell Siri to input information on it, which I haven't used that feature, so I don't know. Uh, a couple of reviewers did say, um, Oh, the GEDCOM file, which I haven't talked about before, that's sort of the universal format for genealogy. And so when you import or export, that's kind of how you, tra how you transmit information from one place to another. So you can download your ancestry tree into a GEDCOM file and then upload it to your software program. And Usually the information all transfers, but sometimes the formatting of it transfers better than others, and sometimes your picture or document attachments will or won't move over correctly. And apparently the GEDCOM transfer uh, abilities of Heritus is uh, not the best of the list. Reunion for Mac, it was made for Mac years and years ago. Um, one of the professional genealogists that I know who's been, who's at the forum, who's been a genealogist for years and years, she works on a Mac and she's used Reunion for years and years. And a lot of it is because it does have really also very good reporting features. And when you're a professional, it's not just knowing the information and seeing it on the screen, you need to report it in a way that makes sense to other people. And um, so there's app that syncs across devices, apparently via Dropbox. Um, there are charts, forms, slideshows, birthday calendars, family mailing lists. You can generate a fun fact questionnaire to play games at your reunion. Um, you can uh, upload reports to your website. It integrates with Google Maps. Uh, they do have um, oh, the other thing that's really weird and is dates. So if anyone has ever been cemetery headstone hunting, I know, it's a thing. I'm not going to lie. I've been there too. Um, I got chased off by a dog once. Um, it was a big dog. <laughs> I was on private property. I shouldn't have been there. It was a it, I should, that was bad news. Don't go by yourself. <laughs> if you're on private property and you're headstone hunting in a private cemetery, don't go by yourself because when you text your husband, oh, I'm about to go to this cemetery, so if something happens to me, you'll know where to start looking. I tried to play it off as a joke later, but he knew I wasn't complaining. But I, I digress. Um, so dates, a lot of times you'll see a death date and the age at death, 40 years, six months, and four days. Right. Well, you couldn't have just put the birth date down, really? Um, and so one of the most used just generic apps that a lot of us will use is a date calculator, the date, at, date of birth calculated by the age of death or whatever the event is. And apparently Reunion has a feature that will do that for you. Small things just make us happy. And then um, it links to Family Search and Ancestry, uh, but they, they don't directly import information. So it's almost like a, it's not exactly like a hyperlink, but it's kind of like a hyperlink. But it's still cool. So I put Roots Magic in here, even though its Mac version is not made for Mac. And I hate the way it looks, and everybody complains about it. Um, it's not very intuitive, and especially the Mac version. Um, but 
professionals love it. It has, again, great reporting features. And for those people who really know how to use it and utilize all of its features, it can do a lot. Um, it connects to FamilySearch, Ancestry, Find My Past, and My Heritage. Um, you have to have an account. You have to have, have a subscription in order to actually get the records from there. Um, it, uh, you do have to input the stuff by hand. It doesn't come directly over. It offers hints from those. Uh, there are fewer charts, but it has more reports than any, pretty much anywhere else. Um, it, uh, oh, apparently not, you can't do this with every program. You can open multiple family files at one time. So if you're the lucky genealogist who has two or three computer screens, don't laugh, it's a thing. Um, two or three screens, one third screen so bad. Um, you can have, you know, one file open, another file open, you can have Ancestry open, you can have Oregon State Archives open, that's great. Um, but sometimes the families are related and you may, and you can drag and drop one person from one tree into another. And uh, there aren't as many online FAQs and assists, but there is a really good um, Roots Magic users group that meets at the Hillsboro Family History Center and it's run by a GFO member <laughs> and she can make that thing sit up and beg and make you breakfast. So if you do have Roots Magic, that's something for you. Okay, so let's play. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick sample. I'm going to take a sample here. I'm going to start with my husband's family. We'll start with what we know. My husband knew a lot about himself which is good. He knew stuff about his parents. He, even, he was getting a little hazy with his grandparents, but he kind of could get within a decade or so of most of their vital dates, and he knew where they had lived a few times. Um, the great-grandparents, not so much. Didn't know a thing. Um, but great-grandpa, grandpa was not beamed down by aliens. He had a father and a mother, just like everybody else, and my task was to find that person. So his fa my husband's father was born in 1938, and he had a, a sister who was several years older. So I figured that by 1920, right around 1920, they probably got married around 1930, so I looked in the 1920 census. He has kind of a, a slightly odd name because I figured he would be definitely born by 1920, but probably still young enough to be living with his parents. So here in 1920 is Perry Parks, and he is the son of James Parks, who was born in Oregon, and he was 63 years old, which puts him at born in 1857. Wait a minute. 1857 in Oregon means his family's his family is Oregon pioneer. My husband had no no idea, none. His dad had no idea. Grandpa was just that crotchety old man who sat in a rocking chair, keep telling the kids to stay off his lawn. He had no idea, and this is how fast some of these stories disappear. So just from one census, suddenly we got great grandpa and great grandma. Um, so there's the census. He was head of household, and farther over it says he's a farmer. And his parents are listed as both being born in Missouri, which is also something that my husband had no idea, his father had no idea. Um, so we have James Parks, Mary A. Parks, Perry, and Mina Pearl Parks. And they are all living in the same household, so we're like, well, hot diggity dog. They are ages 15 and 11, which means 10 years earlier, those kids will still be with the parents. So I went back to 1910, and sure enough, uh, Perry and Nina Pearl were living with their parents, and several more older siblings, some of whom were over the age of 10. Hot diggity dog. So I went back another 10 years to 1900, and there was James Parks, his wife Mary Alice, several of the older kids. And so now I hit a little bit of a roadblock. There was no 1890, um, 1890 census. 
So in 1880, I found James Parks, but I didn't know if it was him because he wasn't living with any kind of family. He was living in a totally different county and he was a farm hand in an unrelated family farm and there was no one nearby. It could have been him, but maybe it wasn't. He was the right age, but you know, James Parks is no John Smith, but he's not the only one out there. So I had to kind of decide that was a really weak link and I didn't know it was for sure him. Um, so I had to decide what do I do from here? because I want to find a good link. So, um, so what, do you, what do you think would be, and there's actually really no wrong answer because the right answer is the one that yields results and depending on the record collection and the locality and the person and the handwriting of the person who wrote the records or you know, the clumsiness of the person who stored the records, you, you never know what records are gonna survive. Spelling. Yeah, or spelling, yes, yes. So I could either try to go backwards or forwards and see what crops up. Um, but first, we are going to okay. okay, I'm going to stop that. Those were actual fireworks. There was not supposed to be any sound. Um, that was. <laughs> It was supposed to be the bright, shiny object. <laughs> and it's about the 1890 census. And it was in storage in some random building because the National Archives hadn't been built yet. And, um, and the facility burned. And all of the population, well, there are fragments in a few states, but a lot of, maybe 90% of the population schedules burned. Um, they had statistics by that point, they had aggregate statistics, um, and they also had the veterans schedule, which was supposed to contain Union Civil War veterans, but a lot of Confederates slipped on there. Um, so, and it was also, fun fact, was the first, the 1890 census was the first time that they really used machine tabulation for the statistics. Uh, the population was growing. 1870 census took seven years to tabulate all of the statistics that they that the government wanted, and they're like, "Oh, dude, we cannot do this again." Well, probably not quite in those ways, but so they started working on better ways to compile information. And by 1890, they input them on cards, and they had card readers, which is you know not unlike the beginnings of computers that we remember. Now this time it only took them six years to tabulate the results for a lot more people and they came in under budget. So we do have the statistics. Yes? Yeah. The census employee who came up with the cards, his last name was Howard. They're called Howard Cards. Mm -hmm. And he went on and found a small company that turned into the international business. Oh, so IBM was started by the census employee who, uh -huh. or co-founded. Did research on the government time and made money off of it. Ooh, good for you, yeah. So back to this. When you are on shaky ground, go somewhere else and come at it from a different angle. Um, oh, So, here we go. I apologize. I usually do this in PowerPoint, but since it was the Mac users group, I did it in Keynote. <laughs> so, you can move forward in time. We knew where he was in 1920. He was with his wife and kids. Uh, in 1930, he was with his wife. In 1940, he was widowed and living with one of his older children who was also widowed. Uh, by that point, he was getting seriously up into his 80s, so I figured it was about time for him to die. I looked for a death record, and sure enough, there he was. Age of 91 in 1947, he passed away in Lynn County. And um, anytime you have a death record, you also want to look on Find a Grave. Findagrave.com, yes, I know. Um, my husband thinks that's super funny. Um, and the find a grave entry had a possible mother's name for James Parks. So another thing that I could do 
is move backwards in time. So I knew, obviously he was married in 1900, so I looked for his marriage record to Mary Alice, and there it was in 1883 in, Cl in Klamath County. The uh, Oregon State Archives has this delightful feature called the Early Oregonians Index. And since my guy that I was looking for was born in Oregon before 1860, it was highly likely that he was going to be there. And sure enough, he was. Um, okay, this is really starting to irritate me, sorry. Um, and there we go. Um, I looked at the Oregonian, early Oregonian list and I found him. It had the same death date as find a grave, so I knew it was the same guy. And it also listed a few census records that they knew if he was on and that matched what I had found. And it listed his parents as Henry William Parks and Sarah Elizabeth Yarborough Parks. <coughs> and Sarah Elizabeth Yarborough Parks was the same name that was mentioned on Find a Grave as being his possible mother. So I was kind of beginning to like this a little more. That's not conclusive proof, but it is a valid hypothesis for now. So we found it, the, the early Oregonians index said that James M. Parks, born in 1857 in Oregon, was living in Lynn County in the 1860 census. So that's where I looked and that is what I found. And so here is the record. There's Henry Parks, Sarah Parks, Mary, John, James, George, and Henry, baby Henry. And there's James right there, uh, right where he should be born in 1856, which he was actually born in 56 rather than 57. Um, so some other things, the census, even though it doesn't have a ton of information, actually has a fair more information than you think, if you look carefully. Um, so what is one thing that you guys can see if you can read it? Can you read it at all from where you are? What's one thing that you notice about that family group? Well, yeah, every two years. Yes, how old they are. Um, yeah, the youngest one, it says three over 12. So on the day the census was taken, he was, that baby was three months old, which is really nice um, specificity. One of the things that hit me first was the last person in the family group, James Parks, age 30, as opposed to Henry Parks, age 34. As it turned out later, that is Henry's brother. Uh, at the very least, there's a high likelihood that he's a relative of some sort, since he's a similar age with the same name. And lo and behold, Henry's son James is name, has the same name as Henry's brother James, which is not much of a coincidence, because Henry and James's father was also James. But I didn't find that out until later. So I'm going to keep track of James Parks and see if he turns up with the family either before or after 1860. Um, so we talked about, oh, yes, there's James. He was born in Missouri in 18, or he's 34 years old, which pencils out to 20, 1826. Um, so you mentioned the ages. Oh, there's James Parks. Uh, you mentioned also the ages. And so the oldest daughter, Mary, is eight years old, and she was born in Oregon. So that tells us that there that we should look for that marriage record in Oregon if the oldest child was born there. Now maybe it was in Missouri and they came out together, or maybe they came out separately and got married in Oregon. Either way, it's worth a look. And one last thing, which there's really no way you would know because um, I didn't give you that subject heading. Those two numbers right there, that 1700, that is the dollar value of real estate owned. So if he owns real estate, then that means that there are real estate records. Yay! <laughs> they kept track of real estate. <laughs> People wanted to know. 
Um, the other thing leads me into my second oh shiny moment, and I will not play this video this time. So genealogy is known for its eclecticism. You never know what random bit of trivial pursuit winning trivia nugget is going to come in handy. And so in this case, the fact that he owned land in 1860 and it looked like maybe he'd been there a while, that's really early in Oregon. And Oregon is, uh, so I knew that I should, one of the places that I needed to look for records, for real estate records for him, wouldn't necessarily be the county deed book, but it would be the federal government, that perhaps he was, perhaps Henry Parks was an original owner, and they called, um, and that maybe that information would be available on the general land office uh, from the Bureau of Land Management website. They have a website that has first owner information. And so um, he, it turns out that Henry Parks purchased land through the Oregon Donation Land Claim Act of 1850. And what that meant, it was really specific. They were trying to get kind of a homestead act and um, going, but because of the whole slavery question, that was kind of tough. So for people in the Oregon Territory, which is Oregon, Washington, some of Idaho and, and all of that, not just modern Oregon, um, if you lived in the Oregon Territory by December 1st, 1850, and you lived, so you could put in your claim, if you lived there continuously for four years and improved that claim, you could have that land for free. Now, it wasn't perfectly free because you had to pay like a registration cost and, and whatnot, but it was essentially free. Uh, you had to be, um, if you were unmarried, you got 320 acres and you had to be 18 years or older. You had to be a citizen of the United States. And uh, if you were married, you were eligible to have 640 acres and what was really different, and one of was that they were early an early adopter for this, half of the land went in the husband's name and half of the land went in the wife's name, even though she was a married woman. And typically at that era, married women did not have separate property except under very rare circumstances. Um, so that was, uh, the other thing that was nice about the Donation Land Claim Act, which uh, was different than most other first landowners and people who bought land from the federal government, there was more paperwork. Yay! There had to be an affidavit. They had to attest to their citizenship status, when they were born, where they were born, if they were married, what their wife's name was, when they were <coughs> married, where they were married. It was awesome. And the Homestead Act was even better, yeah? Do any of these programs have access to Oak Street directory guides who are a great resource in the 1800s? Yeah, the, um, the Polk City directories, uh, the Genealogical Forum Library has a ton of them in this area. Ancestry has a lot of them. Family Search has a lot of them. It's really catch as catch can. The local libraries tend to have uh, city directories that are really old. For, the, for their localities. It's not as good as if, you, if you're doing rural research. It's the, the collections aren't as good because they didn't, no one wanted to go out there and, and get the farmer's information. They were too scattered. Well, I, I accessed some of these in uh, New York City Library, Magnet Library. Yeah. 1844, my great great grandfather was listed as a physician. 144 Yeah. Well, but if you do find your ancestor they, in. They digitized these things. I looked them up a couple of years ago. They had a contract. Yeah. They, um, what they do, they digitize, they OCR it, which, since they're typed, is good because the OCR tends to be a little bit better. Um, and they will have, if they live in a city or a town, they'll have a street, a name, uh, a profession, that sort of thing. <laughs> But my point was, they're trying to stop you when they digitize these things. Yeah. So, Glow Records is the BLM database, 
and History Geo is a subscription website that kind of superimposes the information, like the first landowner information over modern locations. Um, the state land states are not in purple, and they're largely pre-revolution states, and if you wanted to own a farm in, say, Virginia, you had to purchase it. Land was owned by the Crown. It was granted to, uh, to special people to sell. Uh, if you wanted land in Pennsylvania, you may have gone to William Penn or his associates. And um, so that, that system is a little bit different. Fortunately, the purple land, the purple states are federal land states, and they sent federal surveyors out to survey the land and set up the rectangular grid system that we're all familiar with. And um, we are thankfully in a federal land state, and so we can go to the BLM website and enter our person's name and find out if they are an original owner of that land. And then, yes, federal land states. So the Genealogical Forum has the donation land claim index books and microfilm. So again, before the internet, index books were the way to go because it, the tract books, it, it was super cumbersome. Let's just put it that way. And so the GFO indexed all of the donation land claim. Um, there were also some provisional land claims, which people had from really before it was even a territory, you know, the old fur trappers and like around Charbonneau, like in that kind of area, um, there were people. And so those claims were folded into the donation land claim process. Um, so our microfilm collection is straight from the National Archives and it is copies of all of the donation land claim paperwork that was generated. And I actually went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. and talked to one of the land specialists there. And I said, okay, my husband's relative had a land claim. I would really love to get a good image of the actual document, not just microfilm, because microfilm stinks. It's better than nothing, but it's not a good image, because I want to put it, he, you know, I want to put it on the wall. And he's like, yeah, no. <laughs> Once it's microfilmed, you have to have essentially a PhD and a really good, well-funded research project to allow you to actually go in and touch those records. So what is at the GFO is what you're going to get at the State Archives, which has those microfilms, and it's what you're going to get at the National Archives that has those microfilms because they will not let you touch the records. They're too fragile. and. Uh, the index books are actually good. They have some um, some rejected applications that didn't end up on the BLM website or on History Geo, and finding those rejected applications can be difficult. But one of the volumes of the paper index has those, and so sometimes you can tell as much from a rejected application as you can from a real one because it does have a lot of that initial paperwork. And sometimes it'll say, "Oh, withdrawn because he died," or "Withdrawn because he moved to California," or what have you. So anyway, if you go to the GFO website, it's one of our databases. There's an index online. You can, um, and there are instructions about how to email research at gfo.org, and they'll make copies of it and send it to you. Or um, there's also a few articles that they have links to that explain in more detail than I have just done <laughs> the whole land process. So it's really cool. So here is Great Grandpa's land patent. He, right here, if you could read that at all, it says that he arrived in Oregon in October of 1850. Um, here it says that he is a native-born citizen of the United States. He was born in 1825 in Missouri. He resided on the land that he later that he wanted to patent from September 1st, 1851 through November 22nd, 1855. And he intermarried 
with Sarah E. Parks on April 26, 1851 in Oregon. And he actually did that in Lynn County, but Lynn County does not have that record. I've seen the actual marriage book. It's a ledger book that people hand wrote in because there were no typewriters in 1851. And those earliest marriages are not, they weren't recorded. So this is really the only place that I have that says the date of his marriage. And one thing that some people do is they collect signatures, and this is Henry's actual signature that he signed this document in 1855. So I thought that was super cool. And, and again, that's one thing people, if you collect stamps, some people collect signatures. Um, what else is there? So after I got those basic things, um, Henry Parks died a few months later, right after the 1860 census was taken, and no one really knew where, when he died exactly, and they think he was buried on his father-in-law's property. They weren't really sure. Um, but what I found at the Oregon State Archives was uh, the appointment of an administrator for his estate, and it, the administrator was appointed on um, December, what is that, 12th? 1860 so there you go he was dead by December of 1860 um, so she the wife married again to a guy and I just figured on in 1870 she was alone with her second husband's child plus all of the parks children and I thought oh my gosh this poor woman was widowed again geez but it turned out later that they got divorced. Um, he probably abandoned her because that kind of thing was rife. The next time I go to Roseburg, I'm going to look it up because Douglas County did not see fit to transfer their records to the state archives in Salem, making it more convenient for those of us who live in Portland to access the downstate records. Um, and I found that in a journal, an old journal from, I don't know, 20 years ago, and it had a listing of the court dockets from newspaper, gleaned from newspapers. And I mean, these are the kind of lists they have in these journals, these really random things. And so it's, it said as of August 1871, one of the items on the docket for that month's court was the divorce of Sarah Bowman from John Jacob Bowman. I'm like, wow, I guess he got divorced then. Um, so now I know where to look. Sarah married a third time, ever the optimist, had two more sons, and then her third husband died. Um, her youngest son was apparently not a rocket science scientist because in the early 1900s, James Parks, my husband's great-grandfather, was appointed to be his, um, his financial guardian. He was declared a spendthrift. I had no idea that was a... I mean, I knew the word, I knew what it meant, but I didn't know that was a legal term, but... Lo and behold, there you go. And I, around. what's that? They're still around. Oh, they're still around, all right. And, uh, yeah. If more people could be declared a spendthrift and receive a financial guardian, <laughs> the world might be a better place, but I digress again. Um, so these are just some really weird, it, it kind of talked about how he had received his father's inheritance and squandered it all. and. It was kind of sad. Um, divorce records, I look forward to seeing the divorce records because there was no, no, there was no fault. Divorce was not a thing yet. And so you kind of, it was, you know, desertion, adultery, or there were some really bad things. I read one divorce decree <coughs> where the husband was a mean drunk and he held a shotgun on his father-in-law and was going to blow everyone to kingdom come if his wife, didn't, wife and baby didn't re return to his household. So he was arrested, and um, his divorce trial doubled as his criminal trial. So as soon as the divorce was final and the trial was over, they carted him off to the Oregon State Penitentiary, where he was entered into the penitentiary ledger book, the original of which remains at the Oregon State Archives. <laughs> and... Um, so let's see. Oh, and then the other thing that I thought was kind of funny, um, Henry Parks' youngest son, Hank, was apparently a man of high spirits. And in 1880, on the census, he appeared in jail. He was a horse thief. He and his older sister's brother-in-law, who had been largely raised together, 
apparently had a little too much fun one night. It sounded like, from the court case, it kind of sounded like they were not in their right minds at the time. We're so proud. Um, the other thing that I found on Ancestry was this picture, and it was labeled Parks Brothers. And it was uh, the guy in the middle died in 1922. He's the youngest. He's um, the horse thief. The, uh, the uh, guy in the white beard is the oldest brother, John. And the guy with the dog is James Parks, my husband's great-grandfather. And I thought, hot diggity dog. Some other person has a picture of my husband's great-grandfather. This is great. A couple of years later, my father-in-law brings over a big plastic bins of, bin of his mom's pictures. And there was the same picture. Wow. So that is the end of the slideshow. I don't know. Nothing was written on the back of that picture either. No. That just drives me crazy. I know. My grandma. My grandmother left a bunch of pictures with names. Bless her. So if you have unlabeled pictures in your household, label them. It was identified by the other person. When uh, I, the um, ancestry picture identified it, and I have other picture, pictures of James Parks, and that really looks like him. Yes? I've also found maps that have shown where the farms were in different counties. Yes. And that's interesting to see. There are landowner maps that we have, both at the Forum Library and also a lot of other libraries will have. And you can find them online, too, that will list who owns what property in you know 1881 and uh, so that's kind of, that's the landowner maps are really interesting that way yes does the Oregon Historical Society help you out in that way they do uh, they're more based they're more about the history than the genealogy but it overlaps a lot uh, one thing that I'm on the hunt for is a diary from the summer travel season of 1852, because I have another line that left Independence in mid-May of 1852, and um, I want to find out if they happen to be mentioned in any diaries. And so the Oregon State Historical Society collects those diaries, and they try to get them indexed and OCR'd and searchable as much as possible. And they also try and do that back in Missouri, where I just was as well. They have museums with those same kind of projects. Yes. You might tell the people how much it costs to be a member and where the library is at. Oh, the GFO? Yes. And all the classes, don't you organize the classes? Um, some of them, yes. So the GFO library is, ooh, there's, there's that. Um, let's see. This is the GFO website, cleverly located at gfo.org. Um, so we have several online databases. We have um, classes. We have special interest groups. Uh, so like if you, there are several drop-down menus. One of the things that if you act tonight, you can save $5. If you're not already going, we are bringing in to our fall seminar, Cindy Engel. And she has a website called Cindy's List. And if it is a genealogy website anywhere in the world, she has it on her list. And she has a lot of how-tos, and she lectures a lot at the national level and does classes on online research. And so today is the last day of early bird registration. You can register online. Um, so it's 10 resources I use every day, advanced Googling for grandma, Unappreciated tre treasures, libraries, archives, and digital collections. So, like, how to use the internet to find the stuff that's not online. Um, building a research plan, because those research plans, I know it's super fun to sit around and, and lose six hours on the internet to genealogy research. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, and then also, there's using Google Maps, Google Earth, and um, Oh, research is for Go West, young man, for Western research. Um, otherwise, we have a lot of classes. We are located in the Ford Building, which is on the corner of Southeast 11th and Division. And we have over 50,000 items in our collection, books, maps, um, microfilm, just tons of stuff. And we, uh, yeah, we, we would 
love to see you there. Stop by. You can. Um, our open house is in March. If you uh, look on our calendar, which is over here, um, you can find uh, everything that's happening in our organization. And you look like you're going to stop me because it's nine o'clock. <laughs> yes. What's your address again? At the corner, the address itself is 2505 Southeast 11th, and we're in the basement. Um, the, it's on the corner of 11th and Division. Right by the uh, Milwaukee Max, the orange line, there's a stop about a block and a half away if you don't, um, if you don't relish the idea of parking <laughs> in close any side. So some of the classes are free. I don't know if it tells, but then there's a free night once a month too. Yes, the first yes, the first Monday of every month is free research because we don't get any tax money or anything like that. We're just a we're just private organization, and our membership fees are part of our revenue, a large part of our revenue. But the first Monday of every month is free. Um, otherwise, our memberships, an individual on, an individual membership is just $44 a year. So if you come a few times, it's totally worth it. Thank you once again. Thanks, Kristen.